Okay. Now, do you see my slide? Yes, looks good. Okay. I can just leave it like that then. Okay. So do you have any other questions before we start? I mean, we we'll still won't start for another seven minutes, but. Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, it's all pretty, okay. oops, straightforward. But I'm trying to figure out what to do with this. Trying to position my little window of faces here. Also, do you have a preference for whether you would like questions from the audience during the talk or after? Uh, maybe after is fine. Okay. I'm not. I'm, I'm a little unsure how long um, this should go, but I don't tend to use. The, I tend to just go fast anyway. Um, okay. So I think there'll be there should be plenty of time for discussion at the end. Sure. For some reason, my like internal calibration, I, if I add more slides, I just go faster through the same slides. <laughs> <laughs> It's also hard when when there's just it's just a computer. Yeah, you yeah. can't you can't really see the the people. You just skim through them. It, it my mind yeah. goes into notes mode. Right. Reading, reading. Yeah. No, nope, for sure. It's a it's a different experience giving a talk to my to my computer screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wonder, I wonder when the technology, my, my, my brother is, works on virtual reality and he says that the future of meetings is something where you wear some glasses and then you meet in a virtual room, but you actually meet. Yeah. So you are around everyone. I wonder what that will be. Maybe that'll make a difference, I don't know. So yeah, I'm assuming you're in Georgia right now? Yes. Atlanta. Yeah. It's a beautiful day. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, What's the temperature like, there? I think we're close to 70. Oh, nice. <laughs> it was it was colder earlier in the week, but yeah, it's it's warmed up. It's yeah. Mm -hmm. The seasons come much later here. Mm. So mm -hmm. like we're still in the throes of like cleaning up leaves and all of the mm -hmm. autumn things mm -hmm. and like where it's December. So it's so nice. How's the city? Oh, uh, kind of cold. It's, it's getting <laughs> hard now because like, you know, a lot of eating establishments have closed off their indoor seating. And yeah. so, you know, now that it's winter, I'm wondering. Eating outside with mittens and yeah. a parka. Yeah. Right. Cause it's like, <laughs> You know, last winter I was just working totally remotely. This winter I'm actually on campus every day. But yeah, and then trying to go get food is hard because then you, I just have to come back to your office to eat, which is right. you know, not the nicest. No, um, it's miserable actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday was really warm. It was like 55. Me, Charlotte, and Charlotte actually went and ate outside for lunch, but um, 
yeah. today was, I was did not feel like that was an option. Mm. <laughs> Got a lot colder. Mm. Are you all about done with the fall term? About another week and a half. I'm trying to like um, rush to get as much done with the master students I'm working with as possible before they disappear. Yeah. yeah. So it's a little bit stressful. I yeah. feel like this time between Thanksgiving and Christmas is always kind of stressful for me. It is. I think it's stressful for everyone. Mm -hmm. like, and everyone's just had a taste of what a break feels like, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you, <laughs> you come back and it's like pretty intense for two weeks and then you finally do get to take a break uh, do you have any fun plans for no we're sticking around here yeah um i'm my family's all in colorado and so sometimes we go out there but this year we're gonna stay here okay um, we'll try to get out there in february when there's more snow mm -hmm. I'm letting John join. John is our other co-host. Um, I think, yeah. Hi, John. I don't know if we hear from him. That's okay. Um, well, I guess since it's just about a minute before, I'll start admitting people in from the waiting room. So I'll probably just give like maybe until like three or four minutes past the hour to let people that are trickling yeah, in. Yeah, for sure. Hmm. I'm still not used to everything starting like right on time. Mm -hmm. so. hmm. A participant requests that live transcription be enabled for the meeting. I never been asked that before. I'm not sure. Does anyone have a feeling about that's fine. Okay. We'll see how accurate it is. Yeah. <laughs> So I know John, our other co-host, was trying to say hi, but I think he's having a speaker issue, but hopefully he'll be able to communicate soon, but that's okay. Yep. Well, hi. <laughs> All the same. You can translate for right. folks coming through. <clears throat> so in managing the screens, I don't, I have the thumbnails up, but I don't have the chat up. So if something does come up via chat, if you let me oh, know, um, that'd be fine. Is it, are you not able to get the chat up or you just don't have the No, it's more up? about like screen oh. real estate and making sure. Oh, I, I see. Yeah, see yeah, it. totally. Totally. <laughs> Understood. Yeah. So I'll um I can monitor the chat and then um I'll also just um people might ask questions in the chat, which I can then relay afterwards. Sure. Or,
All right, well, I guess maybe we should get started. Um, we have a pretty good turnout here. Um, so I'd like to introduce Dr. Christopher Ledante. Um, he is currently an associate professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology, otherwise known as Georgia Tech, uh, with appointments in the School of Interactive Computing and the School of Literature, Media, and Communication. He earned his PhD from Georgia Tech in human-centered computing, where he helped to bridge the digital divide experienced by homeless families in the US. Since then, he has continued to work with the city of Atlanta, as well as a range of community partners to explore new forms of civic participation through community-centered design. His research is at the intersection of participatory design, digital democracy, and smart cities. He is the author of the book, Designing Publics, which explores how in this digital age we are living in, computing, computing technologies can be refocused towards local communities, shifting the focus from commercial production towards collective action. The, pro, the book provides a double lens looking both at how local communities can arise out of design intervention and then how those communities can take action. So that sounds like a very interesting book. And with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker to take it away. Uh, thank you. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, so I appreciate the introduction. I think, you know, as we get into the talk today, um, which I'm calling Seamful Civics. Um, it really trying to think through some of the boundaries and intersections that come up um, around um, kind of smart city technologies and kind of enterprise platforms that cities use and the way that that interacts. Um, with community groups that might be trying to partner with a city um, to address a local issue. And so as I get into this, I think I wanted to say a little bit more about kind of myself, I guess, to provide some, some additional context to um, the nice introduction that Jackie provided. Um, largely the space that I work in right now um, is something that I and others have started to call digital civics, um, which is really kind of a blending between and the agenda of the smart city with the agenda of digital democracy. So in the smart city, we think about sensing and data and analytics um, and how those things get applied to services and operations at a city scale, um, often for the purpose of increasing efficiency of city services and governance. Um, and thinking about how do we make our public institutions more effective at what they do, right? And that data is an important part of being able to kind of steer an organization and guide um, both kind of everyday work, but also kind of larger policy um, objectives that, that might come up within a city. The other side of this is digital democracy. And, and this is really where we kind of traditionally have thought about computing as a way to mediate civic engagement. I think early forms of, digi of digital democracy were really focused on the kind of privileged moments of interacting um, with our democracy through voting and other kinds of kind of formal ritualistic modes. Um, but more broadly, it's about thinking about how do we um, expand or create new avenues for participation and governance. Um, and, and often this is done through the kind of um, the usual assumption about the way digital things um, enable new forms of access. Um, and of course, that comes with all of the, the problems of how uneven that access often ends up being. Um, so the question then is how do we, how do we kind of think through those challenges um, so that you have a space where you're both providing opportunities to engage with new forms of data as a way to advocate and advance kind of particular issues that a community or a city might care about. And right, so the way that I approach these questions or these spaces is, is through a mix of design-based and empirical research. Um, and so really what this means is that sometimes I work with my lab and we make and deploy different kinds of computing interventions um, to address specific community needs. And then sometimes we go out into the field and do um, qualitative and ethnographic field work to understand how existing systems are being used um, to address issues. And then through the, the mix of these two approaches, um, develop insight into how, um, how systems are changing the way organizations, both kind of formal in a kind of local government setting, but also informal in the, in the way that activists and grassroots organizations use systems to advance their own agendas. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with my work, I typically publish in places like CHI and CSCW, kind of ACM venues around computing. I've also had some uh, publications in STS and social science outlets, um, but primarily my, my kind of disciplinary 
um, alignment is, is within computing and human computer interaction. Um, the kinds of projects that I've been working on recently. So um, in the past, we've, we've had projects around housing justice, right, trying to understand um, how different kinds of speculative design interventions might help support activists working to intervene with um, evictions. Right, this work began during the 2008 housing crisis, but is becoming more urgent again as we kind of emerge from the lockdowns and economic shocks of the pandemic. Um, and where evictions are again, something that are, that are very much front and center among many community organizations. Um, I've also had projects that have focused on mobility, um, specifically looking at cycling in, in the city of Atlanta and how do we better understand um, the way commuters navigate the city, but then also building out technologies that support um, not just kind of figuring out where they go, but, but um, sensing the environment. So it's, an, it's a way to understand the experience of, of riding through the city. Um, that became a, a set of projects that looked at both the kind of how do you instrument, create new instrumentation and new kind of data sources, but also how do you think about what does it mean to um, advocate for something you care about through the production of data so that the, the actual kind of making of data about where you go as a cyclist um, is a way to advocate for things that you might want. Um, and then and the final area that um, is kind of more recent is thinking about food security and working with city and community groups um, to better measure and understand food access beyond some of the coarse descriptors of food desert. And, and, and this food security work is, is where I'll spend um, time talking about today. It's a way to understand how different forms of civic data were brought to bear um, to understand and locate the, the experiences of food insecurity um, in Albany, Georgia, which is not Atlanta, um, but one of the one of the other cities that I've been doing work in in the recent past. Um, before I get there, though, I think it's it's worth um, exploring a little bit or starting a little bit with an understanding of what do I mean by civic data, um, and how does that fit within the the smart city and kind of how it gets interwoven between the kinds of themes that that we'll get to um, later in the talk. Um, so there's lots of different ways to think about civic data and and for the purpose of today's talk, I've, I've kind of broken it up into three layers. Um, kind of at the top there is what I call formal data. And this is typically data that comes from government operations, right? It's, it's living in one or more enterprise systems that, is, that might be um, used by the contemporary city. It has um, a set of standards that probably exist behind it. Um, it has a longevity to it so that it exists for a long time. There, there are statutes and, and Kind of accountability as to how the data are treated and, and where they get kept and how they get shared um, that really sit at kind of the top of this food chain. Um, the next rung down is what I, I refer to as informal data. So this is where I see a lot of activity happening in kind of nonprofits and other non-government organizations where the data have some standardization to them, but they're really much more mission driven. Um, they're focused on a subset of Kind of an overall city landscape so maybe it's in a particular neighborhood or it's on a particular issue um, and they don't necessarily need to live as long and they don't have the same kind of accountabilities that formal data have in terms of maybe legal requirements um, or or the way that um, they might be kind of uh, repurposed across different um, different organizations and then at the bottom there's ad hoc data and this is data that that definitely lives at at the kind of nonprofit and activist level. Um, these are typically data produced for reactionary reasons, right? So some, some crisis has emerged and local kind of on the ground organizations are trying to respond to that crisis um, as quickly as they can. And so they're collecting and managing data um, kind of as they go and it, there's no standardization. Um, there's often kind of very messy ways in which those data get produced and reproduced as they, as those organizations start to understand kind of the scope and scale of the problem that they're intervening with and how do they situate themselves within kind of their area um, of impact most effectively. And the differences between these kinds of data is, is really kind of twofold. So one is around the kind of attributes that the data have in terms of how well are they normalized? Um, what format are they in? Like, are there are there data standards that are being adhered to? Right? Is there an XML schema that you need to that you need to use? Um, are there statutory obligations and how the data are managed and kept? Right? Is it a long term situation or kind of short term management? 
Um, and so all of these kind of fit into this, this idea of, it, of you know, what the data are kind of almost materially described. Um, but the other part of this is the organizational places and conditions that, that kind of constitute these data and are, are where they get used. And so on the one hand, you might have very formal data, but if it's being used out in, a, in an informal place, like how does, that, how does that look, right? When formal city data is being accessed by um, smaller organizations and how do they put that formal data in contact or in conversation um, with the things that they're doing on the ground. And so each of these, each of these data types kind of also speak to the places um, that, they're, that they're used and how they're created. Um, and so part of what I'm trying to get at here is that there are different ways to the data come to be um, and that the institutional and computational resources that are, that are brought to bear um, matter um, and become a place for thinking through how do we bridge um, different kinds of civic actors together with the systems um, that might store, analyze, or otherwise use these different kinds of data. And this immediately runs us into this kind of idea of the smart city, right? And, and thinking about the smart city kind of as a large category of, of stuff, um, right? That interoperability is really one of the main kind of goals of the smart city, that you've built a set of systems that can talk to each other, um, that can share data across each other and be able to inform a much more comprehensive view of what's going on, again, for those it's kind of long-term goals of efficiency of service management, right? The management of limited resources, all the things that, that any city at kind of any scale um, cares about. Kind of below this, this, like say top level goal of interoperability is what I would say is this idea of coordination, right? So the smart city is really also about driving coordination across different service providers. And this might be in the kind of public private partnership mode um, where you have different vendors who are coming in to provide services that get parceled out by a local government, and then those need to be coordinated. And maybe they're not yet interoperable, um, but there's at least some work that's going on to make different systems talk to each other um, so that you have you know, effective governance and you have effective service management. Kind of at the, at the bottom layer of this is a kind of a cooperation model. And this is really about how do you get a number of different civic actors together, including grassroots and local organizations? So they can be more kind of mission and location driven as they advocate or buy for resources um, that they're focused on to address their local needs. And so kind of across these two, like as with civic data, right, there's an assertion of a smart city that they, these build on each other, right? So if you start with cooperation as that becomes um, more robust and, and complex, then you need to move into a mode of coordination because there's different pieces involved. And then as coordination kind of gets settled in a way, then you, you hopefully arrive at some kind of interoperable system um, that enables kind of all of these things to happen together. And I think putting these next to each other um, is where we start to see this kind of crosstalk where ad hoc data almost requires a lot of um, cooperation, right? It, it's, it's about this kind of grassroots effort, lots of individual actors going out, pulling in data as they see fit and trying to get it to talk to each other. Um, and once you get to kind of informal data, then you're starting to enable the kind of support for coordination where you have organizations speaking to organizations. Um, there's, there's a slightly longer term, a longer time horizon that's being looked at. Um, and then finally, when you get up to that mode of interoperability, it really requires some notion of formal data where there are standards, um, there are pieces in place, both in terms of how you describe and work with the data, as well as the technology layers that support it, um, that are stable, right? That can be relied upon over time and across organizations. Right? And so this is the kind of landscape that I'm thinking through um, when I talk about seamful civics and that there are seams that exist both between the kinds of data and the data practices that produce it as well as in the kinds of organizations and technologies um, that move up and down this ladder as they're trying to solve different kinds of civic issues. And so to try to illustrate some of this um, and, and kind of make it a bit more concrete, I wanna talk about a recent um, initiative that we, that we helped work through um, in Albany, Georgia. It was a food security initiative that really brought together the kind of ad hoc data as produced by a, a coalition of small um, local community groups and, and activist organizations with the formal data that the city of Albany was managing 
Um, and this mode of trying to, to enable and facilitate um, civic cooperation around food security, um, but specifically enabling it through um, an enterprise management platform that the city had deployed to manage all of its data resources. And so this is, and this becomes a kind of petri dish in which we got to see, okay, well, if you take these different kinds of goals and organizations and data sets and mix them together, um, do they work well when placed into kind of a single environment that is, that is intentionally designed to support that? And if not, where were the, the breakdowns and the, the challenges that, that arose? Um, a little bit about Albany, Georgia. I think it's important to understand the context of the place, um, especially with respect to food security in this instance. So um, Albany is a small town in Southwest Georgia. Um, it is the home of Ray Charles among others. Um, and there's this amazing rotating bronze statue right on the Flint River, um, kind of memorializing Ray Charles. The city has a long history, so in, it was uh, officially incorporated in 1838, but for centuries had been a commercial center for indigenous peoples in, in the Southeast. Um, kind of moving through its time as a city in, in American history, so cotton and peanuts were primarily the crops that were grown um, by enslaved black people on plantations. And through the 20th century, as the black population in Albany decreased from 80% to 40%, um, it became a stronghold for racism in the South. So there's a really strong um, kind of civics history here um, and the way that it informed both kind of Georgia politics, um, but also national politics. Um, because from this kind of oppressive shift um, gave birth to the Albany movement, which was the beginning of the nonviolent direct action movement in the civil rights era. Um, so Albany State College, which is now called Albany State University, um, was central to the organizing of anti-segregation protests and the development of tactics that included mutual aid, uh, voter registration, and economic boycott. And through the 60s, what this led to um, was a shift in both the civil rights kind of activist tactics moving into what were called long haul tactics, like a, citizen, a citizenship school that was taught at Albany State College um, by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, and then in 1969, the establishment of the first land trust um, in the US that was built um, to support black, to build and to support and sustain black farmers in the area. Um, and that, that land trust still exists. And so there's this history within the place, both of um, deep rooted civic engagement and activism around justice, um, but also some very interesting kind of local innovations around specifically food security um, and how that plays out as a, as a component of justice um, that, that became an interesting site for some of this work, right? And so the context is important here because it kind of provides some, some of the, the framing around the conditions and the efforts to confront economic recovery, um, health issues and equity within the city of Albany um, and how it relates specifically to having food access. So, we started to look at this um, issue of what, what happens um, in this in Albany um, around food access. So where does local knowledge live? So who knows about food access? Um, and then where are the gaps in that local knowledge? And we started working with a number of organizations. So initially the, the project began as a collaboration between Georgia Tech, Albany State University, and then the, the local city government of Albany. Um, and as we started to figure out what did we want to do in this space to address food access and food security, um, we began to build out a coalition of additional um, local partners that included a local food pantry, um, small, small businesses working, to, working on innovative food distribution models for fresh food and vegetables, um, as well as advocacy groups um, that were building up policy tools to help inform kind of longer term strategy around how do you attract the right kinds of businesses into the city so that food access is kind of front and center in the way that, that the city was also thinking about economic development. I would add that this project began prior to the pandemic. And so food security was already a serious issue in the city. Um, one that had the attention of local leadership as well as a coalition of, of nonprofits and small businesses. And then through the pandemic, it just 
put a finer point on how urgent um, and challenging food access was um, for, for many residents of the city of Albany. Um, part of that is that as we started to just to kind of comb through and, and try to understand what data existed about the city, um, you know, the first place you look is, okay, well, what parts of the city are, are considered um, a food desert? And a food desert is a, simply a designation that is an indication of how far is the closest grocery store from um, a person's residence. And because it's a small rural town, it turns out that most of the city is considered a food desert. Um, and so this is in part because small rural towns do not have the urban density um, that, uh, you know, that a city has. And so the category of, is it a mile or more away is not actually that useful because that's a, there's a different, con just a different geographic context happening. Um, but the other problem is that the granularity of the data that, um, that we had access to sat at the county level. And so it wasn't granular enough to really understand and gain insight into what was happening kind of neighborhood by neighborhood within the city of Albany. So in addition to there being an apparent dearth of food options in the city, there is also an apparent dearth of data to help characterize and understand the problem in a way that would be more useful for these organizations working directly to address food access um, and in a way that would help policy advocacy kind of reshape the landscape within the city. And so it was with this that we worked with our coalition to address these data gaps um, and coordinate with city government. And so, as I mentioned, we worked directly with the city, with um, Albany State University, um, local advocacy groups, food banks, urban farmers, um, and this really amazing small, uh, small business, they established a mobile grocery store. So it's kind of like a food truck, but instead of delivering cooked food, um, it was full of fresh fruits and vegetables that they collected from local farmers and it was driven into neighborhoods that did not have other um, sources of food, um, or especially of, of fresh fruit and, uh, fruit and vegetable. Um, and so each of, the, each of these um, partners brought a different perspective and a different understanding of kind of where the challenges were within the city, um, but also understood that there's a whole bunch of data that they did not have, that just didn't exist, they didn't have access to, um, that would help them be more effective in identifying places that needed um, additional services and ways to make sure that they were, they were finding, um, finding and reaching some of the most vulnerable members of um, Albany's population. And so what we did is, is, as a research team, we created a store census um, that volunteers from Albany State used to catalog food options throughout the city. Um, so this was a survey built on top of the, um, the uh, technology platform that the city used. Um, and in, in the fall of 2020, we collected, um, I'm sorry, in, the fall, in, the, in February of 2020, um, we worked with a large number of students, had a, a data gathering workshop and day um, where we trained everyone how to use the survey tool and they went out into the city and went to every food store that they could find um, and cataloged what was in that food store. And so this was everything from, you know, your regular, your grocery stores and your Walmarts, kind of the big box stores to, you know, corner bodegas to gas stations and of anywhere that sold food. And part of the survey asked what kind of foodstuffs were available, right? Do they have fresh food? Do they have, is it only prepackaged food? Um, are there fruits and vegetables, as well as the cost of food. And so in going out through the city, they were able to catalog the kinds of food that was available, as well as the relative cost of, of how much that food um, was for the people that might go to that store. And some of the things that, that kind of immediately stood out to us as we were reflecting on it at the end of the, of, of the day was that you would go to say gas stations and find Walmart bread, but for five and six times the cost of what Walmart sold the bread for. And so you were, there were places where you were getting access to food, but the access was very expensive. Um, and then the quality then became a you know, question of how fresh was this and, and you know, what were they looking at? As the pandemic rolled out, um, you know, we had planned to do a series of these, these large um, kind of uh, data collection days to cover the whole city. And, and of course we couldn't do that because 
um, we immediately went into lockdown kind of almost within weeks after doing that, I guess within a couple of weeks of after um, hosting our workshop. Um, and then Albany became a really uh, devastated place um, within Georgia. And I think early on with the kind of within the nation in terms of the effects of COVID on the population. And so for a long time, we didn't do anything, but then through the summer, we were able to kind of slowly pick up again and on more individual efforts, get um, kind of complete coverage of food stores across the city of Albany um, so that we had a sense of where, where food was and what kind of food was there. And so I don't, I'm not gonna actually dwell on, on the food census data um, details, um, but really start to think a bit more about how these kinds of data sit in conversation with other data um, that the city was using. Um, so part of this is that you have this, in some ways, ad hoc data from our survey, from our census, um, created very specifically to address kind of in a reactive mode, the need for, for more data so that food providers could better understand um, in detail, in finer grain detail, um, food access issues across the city. And that got put immediately into conversation um, with the formal data that the city had around you know, parcels, tax information, the kinds of things that we used as a group to identify um, stores to go out and, and include in the census. Both of these sources of data were then integrated in the city's enterprise platform. And what that integration allowed for was that you had kind of data that the city had access to, they could easily share it with the project team to go out and understand where they might go. Um, and then data from this kind of large collaborative effort to understand detail of the city could then be brought into that system um, in a way that would enable sharing with the city more, more readily and also enable a whole set of kind of technical features that might be hard to reproduce um, in the usual way that like a small grassroots organization might be trying to you know, use Google Sheets to, to manage or even Airtable if they, if they kind of rise to that, that level of, of um, kind of technology platform. And so we could take the data, we could map it, um, we could provide different ways of understanding its impact um, in relation to kind of the demographics of the city. Again, that was coming through the formal data from the city around um, car use or access, transportation access, um, kind of income levels, um, ethnic breakdowns across the city. So all of these, all of these different slices through how you might understand the city of, of Albany got put into conversation directly with the way food access was, um, was presented through the store census. Right, and this enabled a new kind of a set of new capabilities for the community groups um, as they were trying to figure out what was going on. But it also presented a set of challenges because many of the, the organizations that we worked with um, while working with the city to address issues also worked from an outside perspective where they were able to challenge the city in different ways um, and kind of contest either different policies um, or, or different goals and, and doing that through the data and the kinds of systems that they had by putting that all together, those seams and boundaries um, became harder um, to maintain and to manage. So I guess what I would say here is that there were there are two big things that were going on, right? The city was testing the processing capability of their technology platform, right? That enabled them to both manage their own data, but open up facilities so that community organizations could, could tap into those resources. Um, and the food security initiative was building new data resources using this technical capability. And we were trying to understand how does this kind of coordination and collaboration look like, or does it work within a shared enterprise environment? Um, does, is it enough to say that, oh, now that you can produce maps and different kinds of data visualizations, is that valuable enough to the overall goal? Or are, are there other things that are going on um, that might matter more? And what we really kind of settled on and thinking back through this project is that there's three things that we had to do, right? To coordinate across these different data sets and organizational settings, right? We had to manage people. Um, so who's, who's involved and how they're involved. Um, we had to manage the data because there's different kinds of data and it was living at different degrees of fidelity. 
and kind of also different degrees of robustness and correctness, right? Like all data is, you know, they're messy and they need cleaning and they need managing. And then finally, we had to manage a process in which people and data kind of were coming together um, to address this issue of food access. Right, so managing people um, in community organizations, we know that roles are fluid, right? Work is often done on a voluntary basis and people move in and out of different roles over time. Um, and the work that might get done in different roles changes over time as well. And so you have this much more dynamic kind of organizational set where you know, someone may come in and work for, in some cases, a few weeks, in other cases, maybe for months and then move on. Um, and then often, you know, kind of, we can go back through literature and computing and, and trace this out where work gets redone and, and recreated as people move through it. And so how do we manage the way people kind of come and go within this enterprise system um, that the city had, because that was not built for this kind of dynamic environment. And so members of different stakeholder groups um, and, and partners through this project would come and go um, as, as we did the data collection. Right? The biggest example was when we enlisted the volunteer students to go out and actually conduct the store census. You know, we had like 50 people, but they were really only gonna do work for you know, the day that they were out volunteering. Maybe they would come back and do some later. In order for the students to be able to use the survey instrument and kind of fill it out, they needed to have a user account set up in the enterprise system. And instead of creating, you know, tens of these kind of one-off accounts that required the collection of personal information and contact details, like all the kind of all the things, we decided we would just create a, a kind of dummy volunteer account and everyone would share that. This really broke the kind of model in this enterprise system about how users were meant to interact with, especially with this community facing capability, right? The idea was that individuals from a, you know, residents from a city could, could create an account in the system and be able to participate in these different kinds of initiatives and share their data and then come back over time, right? And a, and a stable idea, kind of a stable ideal of civic engagement, be able to continue to do this kind of civic work. Um, but here we, we realize that civic work is, is episodic at best. Um, often it, you do it for an afternoon because you want to you know, get out with your neighbors or, or whatever and maybe like plant trees or something, but you're not necessarily gonna be doing that week after week after week, right? It's a small minority people who are, who are that committed to it. Um, and so as we, as we struggle through managing people, we realize that there's this issue of understanding accounts and how do we create accounts that are low enough barrier so that it's easy to participate, um, but also enable the kind of work it is possible to do within this technology environment. This immediately led to an issue with permissions. So it turns out that access control lists um, are the bane of everyone's life, right? And so as you create an account, then you need to enable that account to access the right kinds of data sets and to have um, access to the right kinds of features. I mean, one of, the, one of the things that we realize is that in the enterprise management world, you have, kind of stacks and layers of, of um, different kinds of gateways, right? So some of these are really down to very straightforward permissions of who has access to what data and when, um, which are tied to kind of privacy and security of these systems. The other piece of this is the business model of enterprise systems and that certain features cost more money and the more people you have accessing those features, cost the organization additional money. And so there's a, there's a hesitancy or there's a, a, need, a need to kind of validate, does this person really need to do this thing? Um, you may or may not encounter this yourself. I know at Georgia Tech, we have the Microsoft stack for all of our things. And there's certain word features that have not been turned on by the contract with Microsoft um, that you might see, it, you might've had in another version. Um, and so like, little things like that start to poke through um, and really impact the efficacy of outside collaborators as they try to work um, within this enterprise environment. And so the kind of from accounts to permissions to access became this chain of how did we manage people that was really tethered to um, the way the technology platform enabled 
people to participate um, and access the, the facilities there. I think the mismatch here is that there's an operational one, right? Because the city, in fact, became the bottleneck in terms of adding accounts and updating permissions, even though you know, we, they, were, they were a willing and, and very active partner in the project. The reality of a small city government is that there was one system administrator whose job was spread across many things, not just our project. Um, and so getting her time and attention to, to address our needs that you know, for, for a relatively reactive and short-lived project was much more time sensitive. Um, you know, that's just, that was one of the things that we had to, to deal with. Um, the other part of this is the kind of the a political impact, not just an operational impact, and that the autonomy of the community organizations that were part of this um, really kind of ran into this idea, this perception that they were only able to do the work with the blessing of the city because they had to continually go back to the city and ask for new accounts or ask for permissions to be changed. There was a sense that there was a gatekeeping going on in a way that hadn't been the case when they were working independently and finding different ways to cooperate around the data that they were producing to, to advance their issue. So tracing through how people had, how people managed and got access, we kind of run into now, like how were the data managed? Right? And so access to the data and the ability to create and analyze the data was an important piece. So the creation really came through the survey um, but then once we had all of those data kind of in the database, we wanted to be able to start to do things with it that would help communicate the scale and the scope of the problem of food access um, within the city. And so if you have access as a, as a user in the system, you could then pull in the right data sources that you need um, to start to build out the tools that would help you communicate the issue. But who then, was a part of that became a, a challenge and were the right sets of data available to the right sets of people. So there were concerns and discussions around data ownership that came out here. So who is responsible for maintaining the data? Now that the community kind of at large had produced the store census data, did they own it? Could they take it out of the system and use it for their own purposes? Again, back to this question of autonomy. Um, how would it be managed over the long and medium term? So were there ways to update the data and who was responsible for that? Right? And the question of ownership was really sticky because each of the individual stakeholders had different ideas of what they would like to do with the collected data. Um, they had different relationships with how the data were collected, right? whether directly or indirectly. Um, and they were accustomed to being, being able to make those decisions kind of on their own, internal to their own, organization. So the city understood that now that the data lived within their enterprise system, it had it, it then fell in with a set of data accountabilities that were familiar to the city um, that looked very different than what it did to the food bank or to the small business that was providing kind of mobile a mobile grocery store. And trying to manage across these different sets of accountabilities and, and desires to work with the data meant that there was a constant negotiation, a person-to-person -person negotiation um, to bring th bring people together. All right, and so finally, kind of building off this idea of ownership and managing process is through this notion of accountability and autonomy. So the data ownership had implications on stakeholder accountability. So who was in, you know, kind of, who were you accountable to? The city as a public organ had a set of accountabilities about the data it controlled, right? And generated both kind of legally and to the public. Um, and then the, you know, the nonprofits and the community activist groups that we were working with had data accountabilities to, to their con uh, constituencies in a way that, that looked different than the city. And through all of this is kind of points to this idea of autonomy around who had the ability to act and make decisions and choices, um, not just about how the data came to be and how it might be used, um, but where it might get moved to and kind of the kinds of messaging and the kinds of advocacy that you might do around that data, right? And, and part of this kind of traces through like one of the worries. So if we, you know, we had a worry around, do I have access to the data? Then there was a worry around, do we um, own the data? And now there's a worry around, well, what if we want to confront the city um, with these data? Is, are they gonna cut off our access? Because it all lives within the system that the city manages, right? And so this is the kind of like path that we have through this where, you know, accounts and permissions 
have a way of framing access that plus a visibility of the system affects how people perceive ownership and then matched up with accountability we get to this question of autonomy and how are different groups able to work autonomously and i think the, the point here is that um in a large enterprise system i think going through like the typical computing kind of mode it's really framed around collaboration and cooperation. So there's a kind of assumption that there's a shared um, kind of organizational aegis that is helping people figure out how to collaborate around a common problem. But in the civic space, that's not necessarily true, right? Within the city, within that organization, that might be the case. But when you open up the system to include community groups and activist organizations, everyone may have this idea that they want to solve the problem of food access and food security but they're going to have different ideas of what that means they're going to have different ideas of how to go about doing that right and those are in fact the kinds of negotiations that make civic work work right we need that kind of contested space where different ideas are coming together um, but doing that within kind of a shared logic of the enterprise system becomes a real challenge and I think this is where this idea of seams is an interesting way to rethink how we might imagine um, how systems get built to support civic coalitions, right? So rather than forcing everyone into kind of a shared collaborative space that assumes that kind of brackets out power dynamics, it brackets out kind of long-term visions of what might happen with something, um, to really understand that there's ways to preserve those kind of autonomous areas of action and activity, um, but build build bridges where appropriate for data to be shared um, for the kind of computational benefits that you get from a smart city um, into the more kind of social and organizational interactions that happen, right? So seems becomes this metaphor for thinking about alternate logics um, that shape data and smartness and connectedness, right? So instead of, of thinking through kind of integration and interoperability, seems gives us a way to think about where different parts come together, how they meet, and how we might either bridge or preserve those boundaries in different ways. And I use the word seams. This was a, a kind of conceptual frame that came up um, in computing in the kind of late 90s, early 2000s. And it, it was really focused on kind of wireless computing and mobile computing and the idea that you have cellular networks that are out in the world and you might, you know, run out of, you know, might run to a, a boundary of your Wi-Fi signal or of your cellular network. And how do we think about um, solving those problems? And at the time, the the mode in computing was to say, well, we just need more coverage. Like right? we want, we want a seamless world. And in fact, what what started to emerge was were some really interesting design opportunities when we actually embraced those boundaries as places of useful design discovery and invention. And I think in the same way, we have an opportunity to rethink how organizational and data seams shape our kind of civic interaction, where we don't need to just assume deep integration and interoperability between a range of civic actors in a city, but rather look for the opportunities where preserving those seams helps different organizations do their work more effectively, and then where those seams need to be bridged as a way to, to do the same work and, and taking it, um, not quite case by case, but recognizing that it's not just a problem to be removed from the world, but one that exists for reasons um, beyond kind of technical or organizational capacity. And so digital civic systems, they often focus on integration and interoperability because those are the goals that are imagined um, as necessary to support a smart city. Um, but right, yet civic interaction is often contested it's about contesting this, the status quo, challenging institutions, um, and advocating for alternate allotment of resources. And in doing that, this is where we need to, again, embrace these, I, this idea of seams, um, where, as in the case with Albany, being able to produce and share novel data sets to understand a problem in more detail and, and kind of more granular level is really important to kind of all of the partners that were part of the project, but then also being able to move on from that moment of, of trying to develop shared insight and back into kind of individual spaces where each of the partners and organizations knew they would be most effective was also important. And the fact that it was being kind of underwritten by this shared technology stack made that kind of separation difficult again. 
And so by thinking through this as, as seams where you can kind of bring them together and pull them apart as needed is a way to try to reimagine how we build and support the tools that support this kind of work. Um, I think I will leave it there. And we, that way we have uh, some time for questions at the end. So thank you all for your attention. Sorry, my voice is getting a little raspy here. No, no, no. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can okay. see you all, I think, if I can do that. Oops. There we go. So yeah, I will open it up to the floor for questions. Um, looks like um, Graham Dove has a question. Do you want to go ahead, Graham? Sure, thank you. Hey, Chris. Um, hey. Really, really nice talk. Um, so the notion of seams is, is kind of super interesting and, and it's and it's as you say it's kind of has a long history in HCI um, and, and has been in in different ways um, I'm kind of interested in what your thoughts of the role of the researcher in, in the work that you described you know you, you have these kind of two sides um, and is it Nick Johnson or, or John Vines talk about designing from the middle outwards and I, I kind of want your perspective on that I think um. Yes, I mean, I, I, I would agree with John. I think um, in this particular project, you know, we were really uh, uh, a convener. So the 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 project with Albany actually has it's it's been this kind of like at this point probably four year long um, interaction with the city that started off uh, years ago. Georgia Tech had a started a program called Georgia Smart, which was the idea was to pair researchers at Tech with um, cities and communities around the state of Georgia to try to help support some of the smart city initiatives that those communities wanted to do. And it was an opportunity to think about what does a smart city look like when it's not in fact a big urban city. Um, and so as, as we got these projects going, I, what became clear to me was that most of what was happening was a kind of implementation project. Like here's a technology we need to go and implement it. And so the research role was not so much kind of capital R research, but was convening who are the right people within the community that need to be at the table and working through this together. And so in, in the case of Albany, you know, we weren't designing a new system. We were basically helping the city realize, and, and this was supported by the, I guess I can share who, so it's, it's Esri was the, the platform that was used, right? The, the Esri hub platform. And they, they supported the project as well. And the idea was to say, well, this platform can do a lot more than just manage your geospatial data. Like there is this whole community facing component, but how does it, does it even work, right? Is it, is it something that makes sense? And so we convened folks around this issue of food security. We actually had three other initiatives lined up to, to also kind of run through the kind of, at least the technology space, um, but, but the pandemic, you know, rewrote everyone's plans, which was fine. Um, but I think, it, just doing this one case study, just convening folks and saying, here, use this technology stack that can do a bunch of things that you've been asking that, that you want to do, made us realize that, that you know, the enterprise model of user management and data management, just it doesn't scale out to a city in that way, right? And so there's a whole other set of metaphors that need to be brought to bear um, to support how, how you actually do kind of collective work as a, as a set of communities. Can I follow on? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Just, just, just because I think that that's kind of super interesting. And then, but do you see that as a developing role for? And it feels almost like you're saying it's parallel to 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 research that that um, uh, universities, for one of a you know, for one of a term, academic research programs can play in facilitating that conversation. Yeah, actually, I think it's the way that the conversation happens. I've been in enough projects at this point where um, really interesting work comes out of these kinds of larger sets of um, kind of collective partnerships between say city and, and different organizations. And when it's worked well, as far as I can see, it's when there's been a university partner that's been the kind of convener. Like it's that kind of anchor institution model where you have, you know, you have not disinterested, but folks that are that are able to kind of 
play a, a different kind of impartiality within the within the organizational negotiations and have the long like the longevity to to be glue over time right and and i think that's an important piece it's not it's not a perfect solution necessarily but it, it's where you know there's certain kinds of convening and certain kinds of collaborating that happens where the university and you know public or private is able to do work that you know city organizations aren't able to do that kind of work and grassroots organizations aren't able to do that kind of work but it, it ties them together. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Wonderful, I think Shar Lampos has a question. Yeah, thank you for the, for the very, very interesting presentation. My question is, it seems like um, this work at least focused on creating these themes as you described across uh, stakeholders. I was wondering if um, data sharing and information sharing uh, can also work uh, in terms of sharing information within a stakeholder uh, and within groups of what could be thought of a stakeholder. And one example that comes in mind is uh, the rebuilding of the East River Park here in New York, where within the uh, community stakeholder, there is there are different groups. There are the lower income groups that want to get it done as fast as possible. Uh, it was destroyed in 2012 after Ida. And there are other environmentalists and other groups within that part that are saying, yes, but we also need to account for other factors. And so there is friction within what one would describe as community. So can this framework also work within um, a stakeholder? Yeah, I mean, think? I think, yeah, I, I, yes. I think what you've described to my way of thinking is that there's actually multiple stakeholders there. So it's still not a within necessarily um, mm -hmm. because you've got, you've, you've got environmental groups that are, that, you know, might be one or more stakeholders depending on kind of which part of the environment they're prioritizing, you know, like, and then you've got neighborhood organizations and you, you know, and so I think each of those, you know, in some ways we're constantly trying to figure out what the, like, what's the, most effective boundary or what boundary matters and how do we how do we work within those boundaries um and so in that case i think there's definitely going to be seams in the way that different organizations want to share manage and, and mobilize around data um and it would it would be a matter of thinking through and trying to understand how those how the goals overlap and kind of where kind of where does that autonomy and accountability need to live um, you know, I think the within question is easier for me to kind of see my way through when you're thinking about like a city organization or something where you have, you know, multiple departments and those departments have different, you know, different kinds of requirements on them and different accountabilities. And so it's, like, it's almost like a scale of organization problem where once, a, once an organization gets large enough and starts to kind of subdivide within itself, that those different units become places where where the seams kind of start to pop up. I know so um, David Ribes and Janet Forteze have talked about seams within kind of scientific um, settings where, you know, like what is this, what does a data seam look like in NASA when you have different science teams trying to coordinate around um, a suite of instruments on a space probe, um, right? And so I think those, those are also places that we're turning to when we think about seams that it's not just the kind of UBCOM you know, seems in the in the physical space, but but this I this kind of conceptual and organizational piece of of who gets to say what about the things that are happening. Thank you. And this is all very much thinking in progress, right? This is this is <clears throat> this is in no way like a hey, we've done this and thought about it a lot and we've got it nailed down. It's like, well, we've did this thing and this, you know, the idea of seems seems to be interesting and useful here, but maybe it's, you know, maybe it's not. Maybe, you know, and, or I think part of what we're wrestling with is how do we come up with a kind of you know design framing or or kind of metaphor that helps us recognize that we need to have support for coalitions to work together, right? And we need a way to build tools that support coalitions working together. But we need to do it in a way that recognizes that 
just because you're working together today on a problem doesn't mean that next week you want to be working together on the same, you know, on a new problem or the same problem. And that how do you how do you allow that coming together and the kind of productive, you know, sharing and analysis and things that we we want that we, you know, we've got computing, let's use it, but then also separate again, right? You know, maybe it's the kind of uh, intentional decoupling or whatever the, the like, <laughs> like it's marriage and divorce, but how do we do that in a, in a fluid way um, that, that doesn't require kind of an overcommitment and, and also run into some of the, the specific challenges that a big orga organization tries to solve with these systems. So I'm just going to jump in and say, it yeah, is definitely. Yeah, go ahead. It. That, 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 the, 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 don't worry about it not being useful. This, the, it seems like a really nice metaphor that, that, that fits in with certainly with a lot of work that's kind of going on around here as well. So, yeah, so definitely carry on. I, I think it's really nice, really useful. Well, but thanks. It's good to hear. Do we have any other questions that anyone in the audience wants to bring up or any comments? No. Okay. Um, well, I, yeah, I would, would like to third what everyone else has been saying, which is that this was a wonderful talk and it's really commendable, the civic work you're doing in the community. So thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Thank you for having me for spending a Friday afternoon. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good, well, good luck wrapping up the fall term and hope yeah. everyone has a good easy slide into the end of 2021. Yeah, and good luck to you too as well. Thanks. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.